Okay, got it. And um, at the start here for our first class, I do want to go through um, this how to study uh, guide with you. Um, the reason I'm doing this, I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence about, you know, that you don't know how to study. That's not what's intended here. Um, what I want to do is talk to you about how to prepare for the CPA exam, because preparing for the CPA exam is a little different than a typical um, college course. And so I think it's worthwhile for us to go through this. Now, if you were in the class on Tuesday in BEC, you're going to be having a deja vu here. It's not deja vu. It really is happening again. Um, so kind of, you know, hang with me here. But I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to uh, take a look at this. And I put the how to study file up and nobody reads it. And then I keep getting questions later on. I'm not sure how to get through all the material. So that's the purpose of this is to talk to you about how you should be organizing your study uh, during the week, uh, over the weekend, that kind of stuff. Okay. So I don't recommend uh, that you read the book uh, prior to class. Sometimes students want to do some pre-reading and that may be something that's useful for you uh, in you know, your other classes, I don't see a whole lot of help uh, to doing that. I'm going to be going through in pretty you know, significant detail um, the material in the book that you need to know to be able to, and I will indicate flashcards as I go along. You're here in class, you'll see the flashcard suggestions, make those flashcards suggestions. I put a little FC next to things I want a flashcard. Sometimes I'll just call out, hey, write down this flashcard. Um, but most of the time, I'll just put an FC next to the material in the book that I want you to flashcard. So after we have had class, say tomorrow, this weekend, you sit down with a cup of coffee and you go through and you make the flashcard suggestions as I have indicated. Now, um, often you will find that there's already a credit card, a credit card, a flash card. It'd be nice if they gave you a credit card, a flash card sitting there um, in your uh, pre made Becker electronic cards. If that's the case, I don't expect you to, you know, write a card when you already have one sitting there in the software. So, you know, you don't have to uh, make that card. So, your first job is to see. Well, is there already something here? Oh, okay, this will cover what John wanted me to flash card. If you don't see anything there, then yeah, you're going to have to make that card. Now, I'm thinking for an entire chapter that might take you, or for an entire session that might take you two hours to go through and make the flashcards that I suggest, maybe a little longer. Okay. Once you've made the clock cards, then you memorize the cards, memorize them by memorizing, no peeking. Somebody else should be able to hold the cards and ask you the question on the card and you would have to answer it, okay? So you need to be able to answer that from memory. Remember, minute and a half per question, we are moving through these exam questions. We don't have time to ponder and try to remember. So by using the flashcards, you're setting your synapses in your brain up to what thought, what's the answer, okay? Then what? Um, then you work the questions and when you work those questions, you should strive for 75 work them at a rate of 75% accuracy. Now, uh, at this stage, I am not as worried about speed as I am accuracy. So if it's taking you a little longer to answer some of these questions, don't worry about that right now, okay? Um, I think you will find that for the auditing exam, you've taken some of the other parts, time is not as much of a constraint for you as it is for say FAR, uh, regulation, BEC particularly FAR. FAR is the one where you really are doing a lot more calculations, but uh, you will, um, you know, probably have plenty of time. So don't worry about time at this point. We'll build in the speed factor as we go through the final review process leading up into your exam. Now, if you don't get 75, let's say you worked 100 questions and you got 60%. That means you missed 40 questions, right? you can indicate in the Becker software that you only want the incorrect questions to be provided to you through a session, go through work again, and your percentage will probably at that point go up from the whatever it was 60% more to probably an 80% or so. 
Once you reach 75, stop working those questions. I think there's a problem when students continuously over and over repeat the questions because now you're not really being challenged anymore because you probably memorized the answer to that question at that point in time. I want you to save those questions so that as we get to the final weeks before the exam and you start doing your final review and you look back at all those questions, they will still be strange enough to you that you haven't memorized them and you're going to have to uh, think through the concepts to be able to answer uh, the question. Okay, then you should work the task-based simulation. Um, there are typically task-based simulation in each module. A couple of the modules don't have a task-based simulation, but most of them do. You should work those task-based simulations there so you're getting practice with that. Don't sleep on working those task-based simulation. A common uh, problem that I see is students don't work the task-based simulations. They leave them alone because they're overwhelmed maybe by the multiple choice questions and whatnot. So you need to budget your time. I'm thinking that you're probably going to have to spend per class session that we have here together. I'm thinking you're probably going to have anywhere in the neighborhood to four hours of homework per session. Anybody want to confirm that or give another time frame of what you've experienced in taking time to go through the homework no okay so i think it'll take about you know that long for you to do homework and keep up with the homework i've given an example schedule here it doesn't necessarily match with our thursday meeting uh, discussion in fact i think this was um designed for a situation where maybe someone was attending two lectures a week because we did used to do that um, but it does give you a sense as to how you should be structuring your time. And I don't think I give you many breaks in here. Okay. So studying for the CPA exam is different. You really have to start to, um, you know, manage your life around preparing for this exam. And you're only going to do this one time. You pass the exam. It's good for life. There's no shelf life on the exam. In fact, they won't let you take it again. If you were to say, I'd like to retake the CPA exam after you pass, they're going to say, no, we think you should find some other priority in life because they don't want someone like me, you know, taking the CPA exam over and over and over again and then sharing with all my, you know, students and whatnot um, things that I've seen on the exam. They don't want that. So they won't let you take it again after you pass it. So you're only going to do this once. Enjoy it. Okay. And uh, if you have somebody in your life that, you know, isn't listening to why you have to study, um, go ahead and give them my phone number and I'll have a talk with them. Okay. <laughs> uh, now you take a look and down here, I talk about the final review steps. I'm not going to do this now. Uh, we will do this uh, as we get closer uh, to the time when you're going to be taking your exam. But this will talk about what you should be doing in a couple of weeks from when class ends to when you're actually uh, scheduled to sit for your exam. Okay. Any question? Okay, good. If there's no question on that, then I think we can go ahead and start to take a look at chapter one okay and it is recommended that you have your book with you um, or the uh, pdf or if you have it on a tablet somehow that you can annotate as you go along that's fine too uh, but you should be annotating uh, as we go along there is no um, need to have your book looking nice and pristine it should be written all over it okay that's what you're going to be doing here as we go through this Okay, so let's go ahead and let's start to take a look. And we're going to spend a little bit of time understanding something about professional standards. That's about three points on the exam in terms of multiple choice questions. You might get one or two. However, do know that you are going to have to do a research task-based simulation on your exam, which will require you to do a keyword search and give an answer as to where in the standards uh, the particular question that they're asking would have been answered. So you can't, you're not going to write in the, um, the answer to that. You're literally going to have to cite the part of whether it's the ICPA's um, codification of standards, 
whether it's the PCAOB standards, you're going to have to call out and find where that answer is. Okay. Now, when we look at uh, audit engagements, really just some introductory stuff, I'm not going to assign a point value to that. Where we're going to spend most of our time today is talking about um, audit reports. Okay. And audit reports constitute a 10 point area on the exam. So it's kind of interesting and in that we're sort of starting here at the end, okay? We're starting at the end of an engagement where we're sitting here and talking about how do we prepare audit reports? What do we do if the auditor is giving something called an unqualified, unmodified opinion? What happens if the auditor starts to qualify? What if there are important matters that have to be emphasized in the report? Etc. That is 10 points. You've got to know this stuff cold. There's no way to pass the exam without knowing um, the reporting requirements. Okay. Subsequent events we're going to talk about, that's about five points. We're going to see that we will date the audit report as of a specific date, but the auditor needs to be careful from the time that they complete their audit work to the issuance of that report, because there could be things that need to be uh, disclosed in the financial statements, and uh, we would want to um, basically be aware of those things called subsequent events, okay? Other supplementary information, that's really about two points. What we're talking about uh, other information and supplementary information, our audit covers the financial statements, but often GAP will call out and ask for supplementary information in the financial statements that we're not auditing, or the company may lift the financial statements, and I'm sure you've seen this, and put it in their annual report. Well, when we start having things that are getting close to the financial statements but are not, the auditor does have certain limited responsibilities associated with that information, and we're going to spend a little time understanding that. And then we'll spend a little time understanding what happens if we're issuing a report where they haven't followed U.S. GAAP, they followed some other, um, well, they could have followed U.S. GAAP, but the uh, financial statements are going to be being issued in another country what would the audit report look like under those circumstances? And that's a fairly light thing. I mean, maybe even zero points might be, uh, you know, a sufficient amount of discussion there. And it, uh, it's probably unlikely that you'll see a question. Okay. Okay, good. So that's the lay of the land of where we're going. Um, please don't take this to mean that because I put two or three or five points next to something that you can ignore it. That's not what I mean. I'm just trying to give you a sense as to what you can expect come test day when it comes to the material that we're talking as to a heavier versus lighter. You need to study everything. The rule is, the, and I see this on the uh, Facebook um, Becker groups for FAR. I didn't, didn't join any of the other ones after I started seeing some of the stuff on FAR because I'll see the question on that Facebook group. Uh, what parts can I skip? And then people will start coming out and say, oh, well, you don't really have to pay attention to. It. And that's nonsense because everybody's exam is different. Your exam is going to be different than my exam. So even though something wasn't necessarily on my exam, doesn't mean it's not going to be uh, on your exam. The other thing that bothers me about that, and I don't know why they don't shut that down, frankly, um, you're not supposed to talk to non-candidates about what you see on the exam. So don't make the mistake of going on to Facebook and start typing in what you saw in your exam, that's a violation of the agreement that you sign with the AICPA when you take that exam. When I say you sign it, you attest on the computer that you are not going to share that information. So um, be careful with that, okay? Okay, good. So you come over and we start talking about professional standards. And let's just go ahead and jump down. Well, before we jump down, let's uh, understand that we have uh, let me put myself in full screen mode here. <clears throat> okay, we have what? We have issuers. Okay, and we have non-issuers. Okay, now issuers are another way of saying what? Public companies. Okay, they issue stock, 
They issue bonds to the public. Okay, so they are considered public companies. Non-issuers are considered non-public. Now, what happens? At first blush, you'd look at what's in this table below and you'd think to yourself that there are two separate set of standards because the PCAOB, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, a creation of Sarbanes-Oxley, the PCAOB has the authority to set auditing standards for public companies. Now, it was funny because before Sarbanes, which came out in 2002, the AICPA used to uh, make the argument that the federal government did not have the legal authority to set um, to set up uh, auditing standards. Um, they it was written in legislation, the 3334 Securities Act, that the SEC had the authority to write accounting standards, but it didn't mention auditing standards. Now, the SEC did what they have delegated the setting of accounting standards to the Financial Accounting Standards Board. But there was this period there for many years until Sarbanes where hmm, it's not really the federal government's job to set uh, auditing standards. Enron, WorldCom happened, and the federal government said, slap, we're going to have an entity that's going to set the auditing standards as the PCAOB. So what the PCAOB did, though, is they pointed to the standards that are issued by the AICPA. So even though PCAOB has the authority to set the auditing standards or they're recognized as the entity that will set the accounting, um, excuse me, the auditing standards, they point to the AICPA standards to a large extent, okay? Now, what happens? Um, sometimes, the PCAOB will issue standards that are specific to public companies. So when you look at the PCAOB standards, and I've lost count, I, last time I looked, I think there were somewhere in the 20s of the number of PCAOB auditing standards are, but there are what? Getting close to, I think, maybe 140, 150 AICPA auditing standards. So every now and then, the PCAOB will weigh in and say, well, for public companies, we want this done. But to a large extent, the standards are the same as what you would see for a non-public company as the PCAOB points over to the AICPA standards for non-public companies. So where there are differences, we'll call those out. Guys, I got to tell you, sometimes I'm annoyed by the differences. I'm like, why can't they get on the same page about this particular thing? For example, why can't they get together and agree as to the look of the report on the audit? That to me seems like a very basic thing that they should be able to figure out. Yet one goes this way, the other goes that way. And we are for it as CPAs and as you know, CPA candidates stuck having to know the differences between these. Um, another area is the opinion on internal control. An opinion on internal control that I'm sure you've heard about or you've seen in audit reports of public companies is something that's required of public companies. Non-public companies do not have to issue a, an opinion, have their CPA issue an opinion on the internal control. So the PCAOB gives a standard that talks about that, whereas the AICPA standards don't require that. So they're very similar. In fact, in many cases, the PCAOB says just do what the non-public company standards are, but from time to time, they weigh in with something specific they want, okay? So that's just a lay of the land, but let's just go ahead and let's take a look here at the actual names of the standards. And for uh, non-issuers, non-public companies, we have statements on auditing standards. You hear that abbreviated SAS. They are codified by topic um, and the codification section is uh, used as AUC, and they are issued by the Auditing Standards Board. That is a board that rests inside of the AICPA. Let me go ahead and write in AICPA here, just so you know that the Auditing Standards Board sits inside of the AICPA. Uh, these are part-time individuals. I think there's about 15 of them. And the reason they're part-time is they're actually practicing, uh, they're actual practitioners 
unlike the FASB, which is a full-time board, that's all they do, the AICPA has looked and they said, no, we want actual practicing auditors to be involved in the setting of the standards. And often you'll see the standard will say you're supposed to do this, but then they give a list of exceptions as to when you wouldn't have to do that. That being the case, uh, because practicing auditors know there's what should be done, but then there's what can be done. And so they often give some exceptions for uh, these sorts of things. So we'll be taking a look at um, some of that. And I think this may be a good time to look right here at this. Uh, oops, that's not the one I wanted, though. Right here. Um, go ahead and make a note of this uh, link. Uh, you know what? I can probably, I'll put this link on, um, I hope I remember to put this link on um, in chapter one on e-learning. I'll just give you the link to this. But I think this is a good thing for you to look at from time to time, okay? Because you can see where they give you the different sections and they're uh, carried out by particular um, parts of the engagement, okay? So the 200s are in the, you know, planning phase, okay? Or the early, um, you know, uh, acceptance phase of an audit. Then we start getting in the planning phase. Those are in the 300s, okay? Then you start getting into uh, evidence. That's in the 400s and the 500s, okay? What is the evidence? You keep coming down, you get into the 600s. Uh, this is using work of specialists and whatnot. And then when you get into the 700s, where we're going to be spending most of our time here tonight, that's where you get start getting into the reporting standards. So I don't expect you to memorize this, guys, but it doesn't hurt you to take a look at this from time to time. So when you get that research question, they're asking you something about a report and you do a keyword search and you're in the 200s you're in the wrong area code. You need to be looking and saying, wait a minute, somehow my keyword search has gone off the rails here. I need to be getting myself into the 700s. What the heck's going on here, right? Okay, so it doesn't hurt to understand, you know, where these different things lie in the, uh, in the standards, in the codification. AUC, uh, AU stands for auditing. C stands for clarified standards. Um, some time back, the AICPA was kind of full of itself a little bit and wanted to say, we want the US CPA to be the world renowned auditing certification. And so we're going to make our standards more in line with the international standards. And that's when they added IFRS to the CPA exam and everything. And I think all of those people, you know, probably you know, spent too much time with paint fumes when they were thinking all that, because that never ended up being the case. Um, so they kept the C, though, there for the, what they're calling the clarified standards. That's all that C. Means. Okay. All right. So let's go back and let's just continue to look at the book here. And we have what? For our issuers, for our public companies, auditors of public companies, are to follow the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. AS means auditing standards. Now, big thing on your task-based simulation where you have to do research. If they're asking you a question about a public company, you know that the first section there is going to be what? PCAOB. You're going to be looking in the PCAOB standard. Point right there just for knowing that for a public company, you should be looking in the PCAOB standards. Okay. Now, when you audit a entity that receives federal financial assistance, or if it is a federal agency, so basically all governments receive federal financial assistance. So it could be state, local government, if you audit. The federal government, when I was involved in the audit of federal agencies for the years that I worked for the Government Accountability Office, GAO, we followed the GAGIS, Generally Accepted Government Auditing Standards, which again are promulgated by my old office, the GAO. GAO writes the auditing standards, but in many, many cases, the GAO points to the requirements of PCAOB, and in some cases, they point to the requirements of the AICPA, 
Uh, so, um, but then again, they want certain things done that are specific to government audits and they call those out. And sometimes they'll call that the yellow book. And uh, if it was worth it, well, why not? Yes, it's worth it to um, show you the yellow book. Why not? Don't kill us, right? Okay, this, where's my camera? This is the yellow book. Why do they call it yellow, do you think? Okay, now, um, in one time they thought that was the gold standard of auditing. And so somebody said, well, let's not get silly. And they just called it the yellow book. That's why it has that yellow color. But um, notice how thin it is. Okay, and you're like, oh, yeah, you know, you know government employees don't want to do anything. Of course, they have to have a thin book. You know, it does what? It points to the other standards in many, many cases, just as the PCAOB standards point to the AICPA standards, okay? All right, good, now you come down and we're going to see that there are other types of attestations that auditors have um, been growing into here over the more uh, recent years. When I say the more recent years, since about the 70s. So what happens? Borrow back, people looked and said, well, look, um, auditors give an attest, they testify, attestation, they testify, okay? The reason they call you an auditor is because you are to be heard. And back in the day, before people could read, and it wasn't that long ago that most people did, were illiterate back in the 1800s and whatnot, um, auditors stood in the public square or whatever and audibly said out loud what it was that their findings were. So that's why they called you auditors, you testify. Well, some years back, somebody looked and said, well, why can't auditors also testify to things other than financial statements? Okay, good. Let's put together a set of, finance, a set of uh, standards for that. And they call those the attestation standards, okay? Now, there are other instances where we won't necessarily audit financial statements, but we'll be providing some other level of service. For example, we may simply review statements, which is less in scope than an audit. And if that's the case, then we follow statements on standards for accounting and review services, abbreviated SARS, and those have the AR and the C stands for clarify. We will talk more about this in A6, but this is where we're looking at historical financial statements probably, but we're not giving a full blown positive assurance on these financial statements. And so those fall under another set of standards. Then we have the code of professional conduct. And this talks about what we need to do to maintain our independence and whatnot. And they say, well, that governs members of the AICPA's behavior. And so I would used to laugh at that. I think, oh, okay, well, just don't join the AICPA and then you don't have to follow the ethical standards. Well, unfortunately, the state boards of accountancy to a large extent, particularly in California, I know they take these uh, AICPA codes of conduct pretty much locked stock and barrel, and then they add certain other things that maybe are specific uh, to the state board's requirements. So you want to keep your license, you better do these things, okay? So you could see a potential uh, question on something like that. These are these standards that we're getting to here near the bottom of this table, starting with the Code of Professional Conduct, are very uh, lightly, if at all, uh, tested. Okay, statements on quality control standards, we'll talk about a little bit later. But this basically says, not tonight, later in the class, but this basically is saying, look, um, if you have a CPA firm, this is how you have to organize that firm to make sure that you are doing quality audits. And when a peer review is done, where a CPA firm of similar size will look at another CPA firm, big four will look at big four, uh, even government auditors have uh, peer reviews done in the case of the GAO, um, where I was an auditor for many years, we would have the um, other auditor auditing organizations of other countries come in and look. I think the Canadians were doing it, the Dutch were doing it for a while, and so on. Okay, um, but they're looking to see in the peer review. Do you have have you followed the quality control 
uh, standards and the way you've organized your firm so that you will have audits done of proper quality. Okay, and we'll get into that, I think, back in A6. But the, uh, you know, the big ones here I think you're seeing are what are the PCAOB and the um, AICPA's Auditing Standards Board's uh, statements on auditing standards, the SASs. Uh, we get into the yellow book stuff a little bit in A6. Okay, so that's just sort of, um, you know, an idea of how these standards work, okay? And the most, the things that we just looked at are the most authoritative, okay? They're the most authoritative. So it's the what? It's the SAS, it's the PCAOB, if you're auditing an entity that receives federal financial assistance, like the federal government agency, a state, a local government, a not-for-profit that receives federal financial assistance, it's the yellow book, and so forth. So those things that we saw are the most authoritative. These other things, interpretive publications, other auditing publications are least authoritative, okay? Most authoritative are the things that we saw up on that table. I'm not gonna ask you to flashcard that because that's sort of obvious, okay? When you read through some of those other things, journals, magazines, interpretations, those are not as authoritative as the standards themselves, okay? Okay, good, now you come down. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our first question for today. And um, if you're new to the class, I put the poll up. Okay. And I give you a couple minutes to go ahead and respond. I'm, I'm expecting that if I have 19 people in class today, I should get uh, 18 responses. To this question, I don't count myself. Okay, so you should respond. I'll be expecting 18 responses to this question. So I'm too. Oh, feedback. Oh. Casey, did you have the question? I did, but I realized I should um, not do it over my laptop. I should do it over my classroom. Oh. So you should you should be only seventeen. Okay, thank you. You can do it wherever you want. Uh, you know, on your computer. Oh, I see. You meant for. Your I didn't computer. want to speak over my laptop. Right. Of feedback. Yeah, you can do it uh, uh, on your laptop. That's fine. Thank you for thank that. You. Yeah. Okay, good. Looks like about everyone had a chance to try this one. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And uh, taking a look, we had about 75% got this one correct. Um, okay, I would think that's good, but um, I would expect maybe that we would have gotten closer to 90% on this one. But let's just go ahead and let's take a look. And we were kind of torn between um, C and A here. And then there was one uh, response for D. But let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. I need to stop sharing the poll so you can see the screen better. OK, and so which of the following provides most authoritative? Now, you take a look and maybe some folks picked A because you saw the AICPA in there and you thought, oh, well, that says AICPA. And we said that the AICPA is the entity that sets the auditing standards. So that would count as the most authoritative. But what happens? Notice they say here, what? Guidance. Well, guidance is not the standards. The standards themselves are the most authoritative. So A is not correct. I don't think anybody picked B. I mean, magazine articles could give you some insight, but they are not the most authoritative. 
general guidance provided by statements on auditing standards, guys. That was those SASs, right? Okay, that's what we talked about. That's the most authoritative. Interpretations, well, they have some authoritative level, but an interpretation of the standard is not as authoritative as the standard itself. Okay. Okay, good. Um, one takeaway from this uh, quickly is um, don't just read the first choice and think you got it. Don't sit there and read the first choice and go, oh, AICPA, oh, let me you know, get this out of my face. Always read through all of the choices because often, you know, I'll look at a first one and I'll think, oh, yeah, that's got to be right. And I'm thinking that's the right answer. And then I read down to the next one and I'm like, well, wait a minute, that looks right also. And it turns out that maybe there was a not in there, which of the following is not something. And I missed that not. And so I think the first one is the correct choice. And I read the second one. I'm like, well, that's right, too. What's going on? It puts me back up into the uh, the stem of the question. And I realized, oh, I missed the word not. So make sure you always read through all the other choices, even if you are willing to give your firstborn that the you know first one you see, the A, let's say, is the correct answer. By the way, on the exams, I think you know, there is no A, B, C, D. They simply have radio dials, just like the Becker software uh, next to uh, the question. Also note that every multiple choice question has an identifying number here. And uh, if you want to look up a particular question, um, you can find it in your software by typing in the question number. Uh, also, um, the answers to the class questions that we go together are in the back of the book if you want to revisit those at some point in time. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at our second module now. And this is just a nice picture that gives you the audit process. And um, we're going to start at the bottom <laughs> today. This is where we'll do a one. And then when we get together next time, then we'll start to go through the different pieces of the audit A2. And I'm not going to index this whole thing with different classes, just to give you a sense that we're starting at the end here. Now, sometimes in questions, it is helpful to know what phase of the audit they're in. So if the question says to you, what sort of preliminary uses the word preliminary in the question? Well, you know that that's not going to be issuing audit report. If you're doing things preliminary, that's going to be something that we've talked about, what, maybe in the acceptance phase or maybe in the early planning stages, right? So sometimes you can help yourself to answer a question as to what the procedure is by understanding where in the audit they're thinking you are, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look and let's talk about independence, okay? And the purpose of the audit is to provide statement users with an opinion on whether the financial statements present fairly in all material respects that the entity management prepared the financial statements in accordance with the applicable framework. In many, many cases, we'll just say US GAAP, the standards established by FASB. So what happens? Management is responsible for the financial statements. The auditor does what? The auditor is responsible for what? The opinion on those financial statements prepared by management, okay? And when we look at the report, it starts to get a little annoying in that they keep saying over and over again, management's responsible for the financial statements, but the reason they get to be a little annoying like that is there was a time where people thought auditors prepared the financial statements. No, management prepares them. The auditor gives what a independent opinion on those financial statements. So we have to be what? Independent, both in appearance and in fact. Okay, so uh, in fact means that what? I cannot have a direct investment in any audit client, okay? Appearance is where we start getting into what? No matter how small, I can't have a direct investment in an audit client. So I may have a one share of stock that's worth a dollar, 
that would impair my independence because of the appearance, right? And so I'm like, you're not going to throw, you know, throw your whole practice away over one dollar of stock. Doesn't matter. It's the appearance that that creates. So we have to be independent in both appearance and uh, in fact. Okay. Now we come over. And the audit report, because we are independent, gives credibility to the financial statements. The idea is that I tell my introductory students when we start talking about audit reports and that I tell them it's a prayer. It's please, God, don't let anything go wrong. Please let this whole system work. That's all it is. All of this is a prayer that something won't go wrong. And every now and then, what? Those prayers aren't answered, right? Just like a lot of prayers. Okay. I go to night, go to bed every night and pray that my hair will grow back. Well, sometimes it just doesn't, things just don't happen. I don't really, but okay, let's just start to say that. Okay, every now and then I get a dream that my hair grew back, but it always grows back blousy. You know, it can't be a nice dream that it grew back and looks good. No, it's always that it grew back in some weird configuration or something. So anyway, okay, so what happens? We have the audit report, um, uh, the auditor's report gives credibility to the financial statements, and the financial statements are prepared by management, not the independent auditor, okay? And then what? The independent auditor, I don't know why they use the word merely. I mean, that opinion's a big deal. When the investing public picks that up, they know that they can rely on those financial statements for making investment and credit decisions. So I don't know why they use the word merely there management's responsibility and there are obviously management is responsible for preparing the financial statements they are also however called out to be responsible for the implementation and uh, maintenance of internal controls that will help assure reliability in financial uh, reporting okay so they have that responsibility as well the auditor does what the auditor understands the internal controls as part of the planning of the engagement so that they can determine the time and the extent and nature of further audit procedures. Okay, so the auditor understands the controls. And based on that understanding, they then give an attestation as to management's assertions about the effectiveness of internal control for public companies, and for public companies, they do that. Non-public, a non-public company could engage an auditor to do that, but it is not a requirement. And very few public companies probably bother to engage auditors to do that kind of work, okay? So management's responsible for the controls, management's responsible for the financial statements. The auditors do what? They attest, they testify, they give an opinion as to whether the financial statements are fairly stated, and as to whether or not management's assertions about the effectiveness of the internal control are fairly stated. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and um, coming down and let's take a look at impediments to acting with, oh, well, maybe I should go ahead and show you this idea of professional skepticism first okay, before I get into how professional skepticism could be impaired, okay? So professional skepticism says that auditors should be alert for contradictions of evidence, okay? Information called into question the reliability of the documents. Hmm, how come it took you so long to get me this document? How come it looks like this thing was just printed off of a website or something like that, right? Conditions that indicate possible fraud. We'll talk about that in A3, okay? Um, circumstances that we may need further audit procedures, okay? All of these things constitute professional skepticism. Um, what I used to tell newer auditors when I was with the GAO, if something doesn't make sense, something's wrong. If it doesn't make sense to you, something's wrong. It could be something's wrong with you, <laughs> okay? Maybe you just don't understand what the, you know, subject matter is, and you're going to have to, you know, get beef up on that. But often, it could mean that the, you know, it was, you know, agencies that we were working with, the agency doesn't know what they're doing or what's going on. I was on audits where the agency people would sit there and say, well, and I'd be like, that can't be. I'd walk out of the meeting and say, do you believe that? How can that possibly work that way? We would dig a little deeper and we would find, hey, there's something wrong with uh, what they just asserted to us. 
Okay, so that's professional skepticism. Does it pass the smell test for you? And if you don't understand something on engagement, you're not doing your job. You're just accepting what they're telling you and it's not something that you understand, then you have not exercised professional skepticism, okay? Now, there are sort of invisible impediments to acting with professional skepticism. And they really have more to do with psychology and human nature than any sort of you know accounting or auditing discipline, okay? So unconscious human bias, Okay, that favors the interest of the client over the interest of the investor. What happens? You're not seeing those investors. You're not sitting there and saying, hey, how is your kid literally going to the investors? You may very well be having that kind of conversation with your client. You see the human being there and they could be what? A subconscious, you know, um, caring about someone that you know versus someone you don't know, right? Um, it may also be that um, you know you have an appropriate level of trust or confidence in management. How does that happen? Well, you're on an engagement year over year, okay, year after year, and you know the client so well that you start to lose your objectivity. Um, I saw this when we were doing an audit of customs. They brought in the customs inspector general uh, to talk to us. And I got a little concerned about what the inspector general was saying to us because they kept saying, we do this and we do that in referring to things that customs was supposed to do. The IG is supposed to be what? Independent, separate. And they kept saying we. And I was like, well, how are you doing your job? You're saying we when you're talking about things that they're supposed to be doing right okay so uh you got to be careful with that one because that's one i liken to you know when you drive home and you're thinking about a lot of different things and you pull in your driveway and you're like how did i get here did i stop at that stop sign back there because you are so used to what the way home that you start to lose you know some attention to uh, details so you got to be on guard about these things you see how you know pressure to avoid potential negative interactions. I mean, this is just a human nature thing, right? Nobody wants to get up in someone's face and challenge and question. And so uh, you have to be aware of these kinds of things. So this is relatively new that the standards started calling out things like this. So why don't you go ahead and put a flash card on that? Um, you know, the, the blank side of the card would say, what are examples of impediments to professional skepticism? And then the line side would call out some of the key words from these bullets. Okay, okay, good. And maybe you have a card like this in your pre-made vector cards, but maybe not. So you should probably go over to Costco and get yourself a big old vat of those uh, flashcards, the three by five cards, and go ahead and, you know, have those available for you. Okay, all right, good. Um, ethical requirements now, and those are articulated in the AICPA's Code of Professional Conduct. And as I've stated, I know um, that in the state of California, for sure, after you get your license, um, you will need to take uh, continuing professional education courses. You have to get 80 every two years, 80 hours, every two years, okay, of continuing professional education. And four of those have to be dedicated to a class dealing with the state ethics for whatever, uh, for the state, I'm talking the state of California right now, uh, four hours have to be ethics. And so I developed a course for Becker that met that requirement for the state of California. So I spent, I don't know how long it was, I wanted to kill myself by the time I was done with that thing, but um, it required that I get into the um, the AI, um, the State Board of Accountancy's Accountancy Act, their regs, and talk about different things and talk about you know known cases of violation of ethics and that sort of thing. So I can tell you that through my you know teaching the CPA exam and through teaching that CPE class. Um, there is a great deal of similarity between the AICPA's Code of Professional Conduct and what is in California's Code of Professional Conduct uh, issued by the State Board of Accountancy uh, through the Accountancy Act. And um, most states, I think, would be similar. Okay. okay, good. Now you come down 
And um, let's talk about reasonable assurance. Okay, reasonable assurance. Okay, we cannot give absolute assurance. It is reasonable assurance. Okay, you can never give absolute assurance for a number of reasons. One, much of our opinion is going to be based on sample data. Okay, well, there's always a chance that what the sample will be different than the true population. Okay, so for that reason, you can't give absolute assurance. The other thing is that we're not, you know, um, super, what do they call it? It's higher level beings, you know, we're not gods. Okay, so there could be what? There could be, uh, we're not supernatural beings, right? There could be somebody that's smarter than us and maybe they're hiding fraud or something from us, right? So we cannot give reason, uh, absolute assurance, we'll give reasonable assurance, okay? So we give reasonable assurance as to whether the financial statements are free of material misstatement, whether caused by error or fraud. So we do do some steps around seeing if there is an indication of fraud in the financial statements, but we do not come in and say, hey, there's no fraud in here or there's no errors. Uh, we give a reasonable assurance in our opinion. We give reasonable assurance. Okay. Okay, good. Come down. You know, I was watching um, an old uh, Star Trek episode, and there's this part where Spock is being um, being questioned by a lawyer who gives his opinion on something. And then the lawyer says, in your opinion. And he says, yes, in my opinion. And they play this music. Dah. Meanwhile, he's giving an opinion about something dealing with computers. And he's supposedly a computer expert. He knows all about them. He can you know, move things with his mind and everything else. And I'm like, well, so what? It's in his opinion. He's an expert in that area, right? So you, know, you get this idea of an opinion and you think, oh, it's just an opinion. Yeah, it's an opinion of an person who has studied college degree, passed the CPA exam, kept up their continuing education, has years of practice, had to practice to get the license. I mean, there's a whole lot that goes behind that opinion. And sometimes in my introductory class to non-accounting majors, they say, well, it's just an opinion. Yeah, it's an opinion that got a whole lot of stuff that comes along with it, right? So it's not just this, oh, I just, you know, my opinion, you're cute. No, it's not that kind of opinion, okay? All right, good. Now you come over, and as we've mentioned, okay, we will be looking at requirements for both non-issuers, which are what? Our non-public companies, and issuers, which are public companies, and we'll get much more into that. Um, and the key thing is that what? we have to actually give an opinion on the internal control along with our opinion on the financial statements. And that's a big distinction between public and non-public companies. You know, I get a little annoyed that the federal government does not require federal agencies to get an opinion on their internal control. Now think about how annoying that is and that the federal statute, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, right, says in Section 404 that public companies have to get an opinion on their internal control. Meanwhile, they don't require that of themselves, the federal government. So when you issue a uh, audit report, when you've audited a federal agency or when the consolidated financial statements of the federal government are issued with the um, disclaimer of opinion on the financial statements, there's nothing uh, about an attestation internal control and the auditor uh, giving the, uh, the attest on that. State and local governments don't have an attestation on their internal control. So I find it a little annoying that here's public funds, yet we don't have a set of, there are a set of requirements for internal control, but nobody audits that to see if an entity is in compliance with those uh, requirements and in internal control of financial reporting, which I find a little annoying. Okay, good. Let's come over and let's take a look at, um, and I think the reason is that they don't have the courage to go ahead and do that because think about it. Think of the headlines. Federal government 
weaknesses in their internal control are blah, 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 blah. Okay. So I think they get a little nervous about having to, you know, go through that hill because then what they'd have to fix it. Right. Okay. So it's easier not to talk about it. Okay. Let's take a look at the objectives of the financial statement audit. And it is to do what it is to provide reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatement whether due to error or fraud. So obviously what reasonable assurance key phrase there and what material misstatement. A material misstatement is a misstatement that would change the decision of a user of the financial statements. It can be quantitative, which I think is what we tend to think of, but it could also be qualitative. So you sit there and you say, if I had known the financial statements were misstated by $25 million, I would have never bought that stock. So it changed your decision. The dollar amount was material enough to change your decision. If I had known the financial statements were misstated by $25,000 because of management fraud, I would have bought that stock. Well, now it's the qualitative aspects more than the quantitative aspects. Okay. That's what we mean when we start talking about material misstatement. Okay. Okay. Good. Come over. And um, when we look at the internal control, and again, this is just for public companies under Sarbanes-Oxley, Section 404 requires that. And uh, we will integrate the audit of the financial statements now with a audit of the internal control. And we will then express an opinion on the effectiveness of the company's um, internal control of financial reporting, okay? That is for public companies only. Let's write that in. When I say public companies only, I guess what I should say is required for public companies. That says required for public companies. It's required for public companies. It's not required for non-public companies, non-insurers, but they can get a report on their internal control if they want to okay most companies don't unless they're, if they're public they have to but most private companies will not. okay all right good let's take a look at this question and you know i realized i forgot to say something uh, when we're exercising professional skepticism if you look back at what we said we were doing let's go back let's go back because i want you to write it over there Michael, where were we talking about professional skepticism? Do you know what page? Page nine, oh, right here. Page nine, okay, good. Uh, professional skepticism, if you look at these things that they're talking about here, essentially what they're doing is they're evaluating evidence. They're really evaluating the veracity of evidence here. Documents that look funny, information that calls into question, conditions that indicate possible fraud, circumstances that extend need for additional audit procedure, audit evidence that contradicts other audit evidence. It's all about evaluating the veracity of the evidence. Okay. And uh, the longer you're in this profession, the sharper this gets. You just start to know after a while there is no way that this is working. This is something wrong with this. Um, I was on an engagement one time where we were talking to um, the director of the San Francisco Housing Authority. We were looking at HUD and he never opened his eyes while he talked to us. He talked to us with his eyes closed the whole time. And I walked out and I was like, did you notice while he was explaining stuff to us, he had his eyes closed? <laughs> to me, it's an indication that someone's not being truthful. And then, you know, was got into all kinds of scandal a few years later for some things that he was doing on there. You know, you start to develop that sense after a while when you're dealing with different um, audit clients and that sort of stuff. So, but it's evaluating the veracity of evidence and evidence can be what testimonial evidence as well. So sometimes you're looking at, you know, facial expression, body language and stuff for those kinds of things. Okay. All right, good. So let's just go ahead now. And with that, as an understanding as to what they're talking about with professional skepticism, let's take a look at this question.
Okay, it looks like most of us have had a chance to take a look at this one. So we're a little under the two minutes, but I'm going to go ahead and um, end the poll and put up the answer here, share the results with you. And the answer here is C. Okay, now this is kind of a hard question. Um, and I don't like when they put sort of these, uh, I don't know, tougher questions so early. Maybe it's good that we're having them early here. I think this would be sort of a harder question on the exam for you. But let's look at this one. It says, which of the following is not an application of professional skepticism? Now, as I had started to uh, write here, and then I moved it back up to where we talk about professional skepticism, we are evaluating evidence, aren't we? Okay, so when I look at this, any choice that seems to be centered around um, um, evaluating the veracity of evidence is not the correct answer because they say what is not an example. So designing additional procedures to obtain more reliable evidence, well, that is what, that is something that is around professional skepticism. I don't like the information they gave me. I want something that is more uh, going to be more reliable for me. Obtaining cooperation of management's explanation through consultation with a specialist. Again, as I had said, what testimonial evidence that the client gives you is evidence, but you will, will almost always corroborate that with what? with something else, a document or a discussion of a specialist or something, but you're evaluating that testimony that they gave you, uh, management's explanations or testimony to you. They're not under oath in, in most cases, but you know they still are attesting to you something and um, their testimonial evidence is considered evidence and you almost always cooperate that with something else. Um, Let's just get D, using third-party confirmation to provide support, well, for management's representations. Management representation is evidence. You are what, cooperating now with a third party. Again, you're evaluating evidence in all three of the wrong answers here. Acquiring or prior year engagement personnel report regarding their assessment of management's honesty and integrity. This is something you're required to do in an audit but it is not an evaluation of evidence. It is what? It is an acceptance step. When you accept the client to begin with, you maybe do this, but that is not an evaluation of uh, evidence and therefore it is the correct answer. It does not have to do with professional skepticism. But you can see how, you know, they take something that you're supposed to do on an audit and they put it there but it's, it's not an example of what it is that they're talking about. So that's the part where the auditing exam gets tricky is sometimes it's not so much, well, it is something not correctly stated or whatnot. It's in the wrong place. It's being called out at a wrong part of the engagement or something. Okay, and that part is an acceptance step, which is down the road. Remember when I showed you the standards and we came down? And the evidence stuff was what in the, what was it in the 500s? Whereas the um, acceptance step was way up there in the 200s, okay? Okay, good. You come over and you take a look. Any question on that one? Okay, that's kind of a tough question. Okay, you come over and let's take a look now at where we're going to spend the remainder of our time tonight, which is talking about the opinion on the financial statements, okay? Now, and I come over and I just like to go to this graphic, okay? I call this the grapefruit, okay? Because it's got these different colors here and uh, looks like a grapefruit, right? Okay, now you come over and we have the different uh, types of opinions that could be given, okay? Now, if we are talking about a um, public company, it is called unqualified. If we're talking about a non-public company, it's called unmodified. But I'm going to show a very technical drawing that describes the feeling of the auditor when they're giving an unmodified, unqualified report. The auditor is happy. 
the auditor has looked at the financial statements and has determined that the financial statements are free of material misstatement, whether caused by error or fraud. The investing public looks at that and they say, okay, we can rely on those financial statements. Okay. Now, sometimes there are problems. There are gap problems. Okay. Sometimes the financial statements don't follow the generally accepted accounting principles. Okay. So if that's the case, then the auditor is sad. The auditor is saying, look, the accounting standards say that there's supposed to be a green elephant on every page of the financial statements. Management did not put a green elephant on every page of the financial statements. We're calling that out as a problem. Okay. Now, if these gap problems go from bad to worse, the auditor is sad, but now the auditor is crying. Highly technical drawing here. Now the auditor is crying. Now the auditor is saying there are so many problems with these financial statements that they are not in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, okay, and should not be relied on. So let's just take a look at a silly example here. Let's say you have a friend that's going to go for a job interview, and your friend says, hey, can you come over? Can you look at my outfit, my suit for my interview tomorrow? I want you to see if you think it's okay. So you go over and your friend nailed it. Shirt, suit, uh, shoes, tie, whatever. You say, you know what? You're going to get the job based on your clothes alone. You look so good. Okay. Well, you just gave what? You just gave an unmodified, unqualified opinion on that person's interview. Uh, attire, right? Okay. Now, let's say your friend comes out and they're wearing a pair of Air Jordan shoes, okay, as their shoes, or, you know, they're wearing a pair of sh white shoes with a black suit or something, right? And you say, well, what shoes are you going to wear in the interview? And they say, oh, I'm going to wear these because I want to show how cool I am or something. No. You cannot wear those unprofessional shoes with that outfit. Everything else looks good. So what happens? You now are qualifying your opinion. You're saying your outfit looks good except for the shoes. So we'll see that there are times when the auditor will say, well, the financial statements were fairly stated, except they were supposed to capitalize some leases and whatnot, and they did not do so. Something like that. Okay. Now, keep going. Let's say your buddy calls you over and you go and your buddy is wearing a sweat outfit, <laughs> you know, and they say, well, I'm wearing a sweat outfit because I want them to understand that I'm a hard worker and I'm really going to spend a lot of energy. So that's why I'm wearing a sweat outfit. You say, no, if you show up in that outfit, they're going to take one look at you and cancel the rest of the interview. You can't wear that. You now have given what? An adverse opinion. You're saying there are so many things wrong with these financial statements that you should not rely on them. They did this wrong. They did that wrong. Could be several things that they did wrong, or it could be what? One big thing that they did wrong. Okay. So as we go down this continuum from green in the grapefruit to red, the problem gets what? More and more pervasive, more and more deeply rooted in whatever uh, subject matter the opinion was trying to cover. Okay. Okay, good. Now, go over to the other side, and I don't know, I always, I guess I have a sophomoric um, sense of humor, because I always kind of chuckle when I write gas problems here, I, so I hesitate to put it, okay, but this is gas problems, this is what, problems with the ability of the auditor to apply generally accepted auditing standards, okay, now what happens, when the auditor is not able to do a particular procedure, then the auditor is not happy. They're not crying, but they're not happy, okay? So they're sad, okay? If the auditor gives a qualified opinion because of gas reasons, then they are not happy. So if the auditing standard says I was supposed to confirm accounts receivable and I could not, and I couldn't perform alternative procedure, I would say, in my opinion, the financial statements are fairly stated, except for what I might be able to tell you had I been able to confirm the accounts receivable. You'll talk about the implications of that. Um, go back to your buddy's outfit. Let's say your buddy shows up 
you know, you go over and you look at the outfit and they come out and they don't have shoes, nice socks, no shoes. And you say, well, what shoes do you plan to wear to the interview? And they say, oh, thanks. I haven't gotten the shoes yet. I'm going to pick them up on the way to the job interview. Well, you'd say, well, okay, your outfit looks great, except for what I'd be able to tell you about the shoes if I could see the shoes right now, because you couldn't see them, so you couldn't apply the procedure, okay? Now, what happens? When our gas problems go from bad to worse, we go from qualified to disclaimer. Now, when I draw the face, okay, I'm not going to put a mouth on this face. I'm not going to put a mouth on this face, okay? Because the auditor really isn't saying anything here. The auditor is saying, I don't know. I can't tell you if these financial statements are fairly stated because there were so many audit procedures that I couldn't perform. I'm going to have to disclaim an opinion. I'm not going to give an opinion. Think about your buddy. Again, you um, get a call from your buddy and he says, hey, I want you to come over and look at my suit. And you say, okay, I'll be, I want you to tell me what you think of my suit for my job interview. You say, okay, I'll be right there. He says, no, 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 no. You don't have to come over. From the sound of my voice, this question, this uh, story loses relevance now because everyone has a video phone now, but whatever. From the sound of my voice, just tell me how my suit looks. And you say, I can't. I can't tell you from the sound of your voice. I disclaim an opinion because I can't see the suit. There are too many things I can't do. Now, disclaimer of opinion is what the Government Accountability Office, GAO, gives as an opinion on the consolidated financial statements of the federal government every year. I was involved in the first year audit in 1997. What year is this now? 2022. They still are issuing a disclaimer of an opinion on the consolidated uh, financial statements of the federal government. Why? How many years is that? Um, now, your patriotic heart will say, well, because there's secret information. Nobody can get an audit of the Department of Defense financial statements. Why not? What do you think? Why no one can audit the consolidated finance of the federal government? They throw all their, their equipment away or leave it in Afghanistan. <laughs> Good. Donald, that's one of the few times that I've gotten that answer. Usually people say, well, national security secrets. Well, no, because you can get something called a top secret, a Q clearance is what they call it, uh, where you can look at national security information. And if you're Trump, you can even bring it to your house and show it to all your friends, okay? But what happens, you are not supposed to, some people aren't supposed to look at that, but you can get the clearance necessary to allow you to look at that, right? So what happens though, they're, the Department of Defense is good at blowing other people's stuff up, but they're not good at keeping track of their own stuff, right? And so as a result, the GAO, just uh, not the GAO, I think it's KPMG that audits the Department of Defense. They disclaim an opinion on the Department of Defense's financial statements. And because the Department of Defense is, is such a large agency, a large subsidiary of the consolidated, for that reason, a, uh, a disclaimer of opinion on a subsidiary often bubbles up into what? A disclaimer on the consolidated financial statements, okay? The other reason the GAO has to disclaim an opinion every year on the federal government's financial statements is that the balance sheet doesn't balance. There's a about $4 trillion plug that has to be put on the financial statements every year to make it balance. And the reason is that there are 32 different agencies that constitute the consolidated financial statements of the federal government. And what happens is each of those agencies has their own system for issuing their financial statements. Then there's a separate system that does what? That tries to put together consolidation and then they try to get the two to match. Guess what? It doesn't work because that's not how you do a consolidation. You do consolidation what? From the bottom up, don't you? They have two separate systems and then they try to reconcile them and they can't figure it out every year. And so for that reason, we got a $4 trillion plug yeah, I think that's pervasive, a big enough problem to constitute a disclaimer of opinion on the financial statements. So those are the kinds of things, huge things that lead you uh, to a disclaimer, okay? Now, what we're gonna be looking at now that we understand the nature of these, we're gonna be looking, it's really focusing on how we will go from a happy, unmodified, 
for a non-public company, unqualified for a public company report, and how we will take that report and adjust it, modify it accordingly when we have what? When we have these other issues that are coming in because of uh, uh, you know gap and gas problems. The one thing that you do see in quite a few of the exam questions is they'll say, which of the following would have the auditor decide between a qualified or adverse opinion? The answer is going to be what? A gap problem. If it's a gas problem, then what? The decision is between qualified or disclaimer, or they'll describe a gap problem. The entity did not capitalize certain leases that should have been capitalized. What kind of opinion should the auditor give? And the correct choice will be the decision between qualified or adverse, not qualified or disclaimer. Okay, so it's worth understanding when we're on gas issue versus gap issues. And as we go from, you know, problems, we start encountering problems, how the language you use, it's qualified, for both of them, but then as the problems get more pervasive, for gap problems, it goes from qualified to adverse. For gas problems, it goes from qualified to disclaimer. Okay. Okay, good. So I'm looking at our time here, and I'm going to go ahead and jump in with the break right now. I, well, in a second, because uh, let's just go ahead and look. The unmodified, unqualified opinion. Okay is when the auditor says that the financial statements are free in all material respects, okay, free of uh, error, uh, whether uh, errors and uh, misstatements, I should say. And note that the uh, unmodified term is used for non-issuers, unqualified is a term used for issuers. I don't know, I guess you could probably flashcard that. I don't know that that's something that's so hard to remember that you should flashcard it, but go ahead. And then the types of opinions now, just going over to the next page, taking a look, we have what we saw. We have qualified, that re relates to both gas and gap problems. Adverse relates to gap problems. Disclaimer of opinion uh, comes up with the gas problems only, okay? All right, so with that, before we take the break, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this question. Okay, guys, let's go ahead 
And let's take a look at this. And um, it looks like most of us got this right. I would have hoped for a higher batting average than 75 on this one. So um, when you look at this, are you guys reading the question? Um, it says an auditor of a non-issuer concludes that a client's illegal act, which has a material effect on the financial statements, has not been properly accounted for or disclosed. And what kind of opinion should we give? And I got somebody picking D. And I'm thinking, well, what would make you think that it would be unmodified if they're calling out a problem? As we start to have problems, as the auditor starts to get sad, we start moving to the continuum of qualified. And depending on whether it's a gap problem or a gas problem, it'll be adverse for gap and uh, disclaimer for, um, <clears throat> you know, for uh, gas problems. When you look at A, which I think two people picked A, adverse opinion or disclaimer opinion is not even in the right ballpark because there is no decision between adverse or disclaimer. They're on the opposite ends of the situation here. Okay, disclaimers for gas problems, adverse is for gap problems. So the auditor is really never weighing, should I give a disclaimer? Should I give an adverse? With an adverse, you know what the problem is. With a disclaimer, you don't know what the problem is. So there's no way A would be correct. I'm not sure why a couple of us picked that one. Please don't pick the first choice just to get the pull out of your face because um, I'm gonna start calling on you folks if that keeps happening. Looking at item, uh, C, disclaimer of an opinion or an unmodified opinion with an emphasis of matter. Again, how can we pick an unmodified opinion when they're calling out problems? So even if you didn't understand that this was a gap uh, problem, <laughs> okay, which is what they're talking about, something's not being properly accounted for, that is language just pointing to you that it's a gap problem. You still should have been able to get the answer just by understanding that little grapefruit chart. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and we will take the break at this time. And um, I'm going to go ahead and put us at, uh, I guess, 645. We'll go a little longer uh, so that we get the full 10 minutes, a little plus here. And uh, we will pick up with module four, okay? I'm gonna pause the recording. Somebody please remind me to uh, start it again when we come back. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and resume the recording and um, let's go ahead and take a look at module uh, four. And uh, as we were going to the break, uh, Banghead asked, you know, what's the difference with the public versus the unpublic, uh, non-public companies. And when we look at the, and they often call it the clean opinion. Sometimes you'll see that terminology. Clean opinion means that the auditor is what? Is happy. When we say cleanliness is happiness, right? The clean opinion means the auditor is happy. And then if it's called what? unmodified, then we are talking about a non-public company. If it's a what, public company, it's called unqualified. And sometimes uh, students have a little trouble getting used to that. Well, unqualified, when they tell you you're unqualified for something, that's usually bad, right? But in the case of uh, the uh, opinion unqualified is good because we're saying it. unqualified. I'm not going to give you any excuses. The financial statements are free of material mistake. Of course, it's a reasonable assurance. Now, Bang, when you ask me, you know, um, it, what's the difference? Um, that word is different, but the structure of the report is also going to be different depending on whether it's a public or non-public company. So we're going to have to go through the pain of understanding how the report looks different, even though in both cases, the auditor is happy, it's a clean opinion. 
In one case, we call it unmodified. The other case, we call it unqualified. Um, this is what I was talking about. To me, this is annoying because why can't the Auditing Standards Board, the ASB, and the PCAOB, you know, throw them in a room, let them get together and figure out what the report should look like and stop bothering us with these differences, okay? But unfortunately, um, you know, they're not doing that. So we have to understand how both the public and non-public, both the issuer and non-issuer reports look like. We're gonna start with the non-issuer, okay? Now, they go ahead and they give us this uh, table here. And, um, what I'm going to ask you to do right at the start here is to flashcard just this column, the structure of the report. Okay, again, this is for the unmodified report, which is what we call it for public companies. Okay, I mean, excuse me, for non public companies. And first, we have the, un, the auditor's opinion, that's an unmodified opinion. Then we have the basis for the opinion. Okay, so I want you to put that on the flashcard. Second is the basis. This is the structure, okay? Then you don't have to put that next one on the flashcard because we're gonna talk about going concern uh, issues and they're not always relevant. So I don't want you to put that on the flashcard. I just wanna talk about the standard clean opinion without some of these things that they're calling in on this table. So you don't have to put that second, that third one on the flashcard, first one, the second one. Then, um, and you don't have to put that key matters, okay, because that's not always the case, and we'll talk about key matters here a little bit later, but actually, you know what, put the key matters there, go ahead, you can put that on the flashcard, the key matters, okay, you can put that there, number three, then number four, this is in the order of how it will appear in the report, will be management's responsibilities. Then there'll be, and these are pretty much aligned with paragraphs in the report or sections of the report, I should say. Fifth section will be the auditor's responsibility, right? Management's responsible for the financial statements and the internal control. Auditor's responsible for the opinion, okay? And then, um, You can continue the flashcard number six, signature of the auditor, and um, seventh date of the report. Okay, that's just intended to give you, you don't have to put this whole blah, blah, blah on the flashcard, just those key headings, okay, are the ones that I want you because, you know, you want to know the order that these things appear, okay. Now you come over, and the reason I'm not really getting too much off into that detail is we are actually going to make flashcards of the entire report, okay? So what you probably would wanna do, assuming there aren't any flashcards in your set that do this, is have a, a flashcard for each of these major sections, major headings, okay? So what you'll do is the opinion, and you're going to word for word memorize what goes into that opinion. Sorry, guys. You see this thing? You don't let me box this off or it's going to fight me. Okay, so you're going to make a flashcard of that opinion paragraph. So we start with the opinion. You come right out of the gate telling us what our conclusions are. In our opinion, the financial statements are what? free of material misstatement, okay? And we call out the years that were <clears throat> involved and we call out the different financial statements, the balance sheet, which they're calling statement of financial position, statement of operations is the income statement and so on, okay? Now we have the flashcard that tells us what comes next, which is the basis for our opinion, okay? But um, I want you to make a flashcard of the entire thing. Keep fighting with this box thing here. Okay, so make a flashcard of that entire paragraph. I want you to memorize it, guys. I know it's a pain in the you know what, but I want you to memorize this because here's what <clears throat> will happen on the exam. 
they will give you task-based simulation. And they'll say, your staff submitted a draft of the audit report to you. What notes will you give them as to how they need to correct any deficiency? Well, if you've got the thing memorized, that's a piece of cake question, isn't it? I mean, because you have it memorized, you're gonna be, well, this is wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, this shouldn't be there, that should have been there. They might give you a question in which they'll say, somebody else provided notes. Do you agree with what this person has put down as notes? Well, if you look at that, if you have that memorized, that question's a piece of cake, isn't it? Okay, so you're going to get a question like that. Further, when we start looking at, well, what happens if we have to give a qualified opinion? What happens if we have to give adverse disclaimer? Knowing the foundation of the unmodified, unqualified, the clean report, then allows you to just know where to plug in what we need to plug in when these things start to happen. Okay, so that's why I want you to memorize the structure. I want you to memorize all the words, word for word. You can be able to recite it. You know, you should be able to go out to dinner and look into the eyes of that beautiful person across the table and say, we have audited the financial statements of the XYZ company. And they'll all oh, say that to me again. Okay, that's how well you should know it. Okay, now you come over <clears throat> and the next thing is the responsibility of management. Okay, we know that from that other flashcard that I asked you to make. Okay, so um, again, um, I think they stuck in there that the key audit matters, and I went ahead and, and told you to go ahead and put that in, but um, you don't always have to have key audit matters, at least for the um, non-public companies okay so it's an auditor judgment thing as to whether or not you're going to bring up a key audit matter um so it may or may not be there the reason i had you include it though is that because public companies you must call out a critical audit matter i think the trend is probably towards having that in non-public companies reports as well so that's why i want you to put that there but it is not always going to be in the non-public company report where it will always be in the public company audit report although they call it critical audit matters over there okay then coming back flash card for the detail of the auditor's responsibility okay give me that whole paragraph flash card okay and then, in my opinion, they started cluttering up the report um, with all this stuff. And so uh, I doubt that questions will really get too, too crazy off into a lot of the um, details that you're seeing on this part. So what I want to do is I'm going to ask you to flash card for this one, the things I highlight. Okay, I'm going to highlight some key words for you here that I want you to flash card. So in performing the audit in accordance with GAS, we exercise professional judgment, identify the at and assess the risk of material misstatement. Okay, we obtain an understanding of internal control in order to design audit procedures. Uh, but not to express an opinion on the internal control, so no opinion is expressed. That would be different for a public company, right? But for a non-public company, uh, we need to make sure that people understand, hey, we're not giving an opinion on the internal control here, okay? Conclude whether or not judgments, um, um, conclude whether in our judgment there are conditions or events considered in the aggregate that raise substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. And if you had that concern, then you would have to put that up as one of the elements. But um, you make that conclusion, if you don't have concern that they're going to go out of business, you don't have to uh, provide the going concern paragraph, but you have to say that you considered that, OK? And then um, that you communicated with those charged with governance, um, put that in there. Um, other information, okay, put um, that um, 
our opinion on the financial statements does not cover the other information, okay? What we're talking about here, guys, is we have the financial statements, but then what? Sometimes there's supplementary information. If you have studied for FAR, remember we talked about um, the required supplemental information like an MDNA that has to go along with the set of financial statements. That's the kind of thing they're talking about there. And then sometimes companies will lift this whole thing and put it where? In their annual report. Okay. And we're going to see that our opinion only covers the financial statements. It doesn't cover all this other stuff. But and so we want folks to understand that when we give an opinion, even though you may see our opinion in the middle of this other stuff, our opinion does not extend to this other stuff. Okay, that's what that um, you know sentence or whatever is trying to tell you. And then um, letting folks know that you do read it for material inconsistency. So if they're saying, even though your opinion doesn't cover the annual report, if they say in the annual report, and we showed a record profit this year, and our profit increased 150%, and you're like, first of all, it's not a record profit, and secondly, it didn't increase, it decreased. What are you talking about? Okay, that's the kind of material inconsistency that if you did see that <clears throat> material inconsistency, you would have to call that out in the report. Okay, here we're saying, we're just letting you know, as far as this other stuff, our job is to read it and identify if there's a material inconsistency. And then if there are legal requirements and whatnot, uh, you would have that if necessary. Okay, when applicable, why don't you put that on the flashcard? But this is only relevant when it's applicable. Okay, now that's a lot of work there, guys, to memorize that. Don't underestimate that. That's gonna take you some time because that's a long report. They've got a lot of stuff in there and it's going to take you some time to memorize the cards as to what's in there. But I promise you, when you start working your task-based simulation for this chapter, when you're on the exam, more importantly, you're going to say, okay, this was the smartest thing I've done, which is to memorize this opinion. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come down and over to the next page. And uh, take a look at um, what happens if we conduct an audit in accordance with two sets of standards, okay? Then um, the auditor may indicate that the audit was conduct conducted in accordance with another set of auditing standards, okay? And you can put additional language as the basis for the opinion and you'd say, hey, not only did we audit according to gas? We also audit according to the international standards or whatever it is. Okay, so you can go ahead and flashcard that. You just call out the other set of standards. Also, audits in accordance with gas and PCAOB standards. Okay, and when conducting an audit in accordance with both gas and PCAOB. Um, the auditor is required to uh, follow GAS. In addition, the auditor should use the report required by the PCAOB and amend the PCAOB report to state that the audit was also conducted in accordance with GAS. So you give both reports and then you amend them accordingly um, and uh, say, hey, you know, we also follow the other standards. Uh, this would be the case if you have a uh, company that's probably anticipating going public relatively soon and they've gone ahead and they've started to um, you know get up to speed with what the requirements are for the uh, PCAOB requirements but because they're not public yet you're still supposed to follow the AICPA standards okay okay good now let's take a look at uh, this key audit matters discussion Okay, and the key audit matters, okay, are those matters that uh, were most of most significance in the audit of the financial statements of the current period, such matters are selected from the matters communicated to those charged with governance, okay, 
and um, entities have the option of whether to engage the auditor to communicate key auto matters, but should consider the needs of users of the financial statements when making this determination. So the it's an optional thing, okay? We don't have to provide that key audit matters. That's why I didn't want you to include the flashcard there. Or did I ask you? I can't remember now if I asked you to do it or not. Did I ask you to put that on the flashcard? Yep. Yeah. Okay, but it's not required. Just understand that, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and uh, let's take a look at... Uh, we're not going to go on and on about key uh, audit matters here. Um, well, let's let's go ahead and look at uh, um, a couple things about the key audit matters. Sorry, guys, I do want to look at a couple of these things um, down here as to when the auditor is going to consider um, <clears throat> when deciding to put in a key audit matter right here, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, when deciding which matters of any should be communicated as key audit matters, okay? Uh, areas with higher assessed risk of material misstatement, consider that. Areas requiring significant auditor management judgment, significant events or transactions, and the determination of which matters to include as a CAM is ultimately a matter of professional judgment. Okay, and so flashcard that also about the key audit matters. I don't think that the examiners are going to go crazy on that. It's an optional thing that you use professional judgment about. And uh, so I think that's probably enough of that. Okay, okay, good. Let's look now at the un, we call it unqualified, the clean opinion now for um <clears throat> for public companies, for issuers, okay? And again, I'm gonna take the same approach, which is to ask you to flashcard at a high level, the sections, okay? So you'll have the title, you'll have the addressee, you have the what? Opinion section, okay? You have the basis for opinion section, Okay, and then you have critical matters and you always have critical matters. That is like the CAM, uh, the, the, uh, the key audit matters here, we call them critical audit matters. And then <clears throat> you would have the signature and the report date, okay? All right, so just flashcard at a high level. I say flashcard, yeah, see, flashcard at a high level, those elements or sections, if you will, uh, of the now <clears throat> unqualified report for issues. And then let's go ahead and let's look at <clears throat> the report itself. And again, easier to memorize because it's shorter. <laughs> you're going to go ahead and memorize the whole report, paragraph by paragraph. Okay, now notice there's quite a bit of similarity. However, they don't go on and on with auditor's responsibility like the other one does. Okay, notice, guys, we're calling out what standards now? PCAOB standards, okay, because we're a public company. So we would, we we're auditing a public company. And then, yes, you must have the critical matters. You don't need to memorize that paragraph because it just depends on whatever the critical matter is. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, when you look at Apple's financial report, their, their, their audit report, I think the critical matter is that they've taken some sort of tax position that the uh, auditors, I think it's EY that audit, audits them, decided to call out. And I look at that, I just find this annoying. So you're telling the auditor, don't use any judgment, find something to put as a critical matter. Well, that to me kind of takes away the whole idea that I'm communicating to you things that in my judgment are worth putting in the report. It gets me to a point where I have to put something in the report as a critical matter. And I don't 
think that that's the way auditing standards ought to work. It ought to be guidance that tells me what I need to do, and I decide what is critical enough that it should probably be called out in the report. Okay, so it kind of goes against the grain a little bit. Okay, but let's since it is required. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and let's take a look uh, at these critical matters. By the way, this is still an unmodified opinion. It is still an unmodified opinion. Okay, so let's take a look and see <clears throat> what goes in to this critical matters, okay? And I think the mnemonic here is iPad, okay? I'm not a huge fan of their little bubbles and mnemonics, uh, so I generally will ignore those. But if it's just a word that you have to remember, and you know, we've sat here and we used Apple as an example of having what their critical matter was. Let's go with that energy. Okay, so you have to identify what the critical matter is, description of the principal considerations that led you to determine that there's a critical matter, description of what it is, and reference to the relevant financial statement disclosure about that, and put on there on that same flashcard that CAM does not modify the opinion. It doesn't cause a qualification or anything like that, okay? Okay, good. <clears throat> They didn't want to get sued for using the term iPad. So they said, uh, for each cam, make sure you identify it on a pad of paper so that nobody would call them out that they were using the term iPad. <laughs> okay, now you come over and you take a look. And um, in situations which the auditor determines there are no critical matters, the auditor should include the following language. Uh, in the critical matters section saying, oh, okay, I guess you could say we don't have a critical matter. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like the person that says, look, you know, and you turn and you look and they say, ah, I made you look. Okay, now we got to put the thing in there so you can read it to see that there is nothing there. Professor, I'm just curious, yeah. do you have an example of a critical matter? Would it be like, you know, an insurance company, critical matter if there's fires in California or, I mean, what would be an example? That could be, but, um, you know, I gave the example of Apple. They took some sort of, um, um, let's see if I can find Apple's uh, report, 10K report real quick. Um, they, they took some sort of tax position that EY decided should be called out as a critical matter. Um, so let's see if I can find it without having to expose my whole computer here. Uh, where did I have that? I have that in my... <clears throat> financial accounting slides. There it is. So when you come down and you look at uh, financial statements and supplementary data. Okay, and then reports of independent registered public accounting firm. And there's the opinion, there's a basis for the opinion, there's a critical matter. And I guess they took some sort of uncertain tax position that they had to call out, whatever. And then um, I think this was uh, how they addressed the matter, and this was EY. Okay? Sure. Yeah. So you can see this stuff is, you know, living, breathing. You know, I know we're kind of sitting here and stuff gets a little dry, but it's really out there, right? Stuff's really, they're really doing this stuff. So, okay. So let me get back here. And um, <clears throat> uh, that's enough, I think. That's enough. 
Okay, that is it. again, they can go over on and on with this. Um, now, when for public companies, okay, when management is required to report on the company's internal control, which is the case for public companies, uh, but such report is not required to be audited and the auditor was not engaged to perform an audit of management's assessment of effectiveness of internal control of financial reporting, the auditor must include a statement in the auditor's report as the basis for opinion. The company is not required to, nor has the auditor engaged to perform an audit of its internal control of financial reporting in the unusual circumstance that happens. Just like we saw in the non-public company report, um, you would want to call that out so that people understand, hey, if you're looking for that, it ain't here. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look add a question. Oh, you know, let's do this one together. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You can do it. And then I'll go over it. Go ahead. Okay, looks like most of us have had a chance to uh, take a look at this one and we're getting up on two minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And uh, okay, yeah, you know, 60% on a question like this is completely understandable um, because this is a dumb question. And I wish Becker would take it out of the class questions in the textbook. Okay, the correct answer is an unmodified opinion. Okay, and the idea here, the concept is that we don't mention anywhere in the textbook, that if someone has departed, remember our, our objective is what? To make sure investors and creditors are getting uh, reliable information they can use to make their decisions, right? Well, if an unusual circumstances by following GAP, the statements were misleading, then you would be okay with them not following GAP and you could issue an unmodified opinion. The problem that I have with this stupid question, okay, excuse my, you know, for being kind of rude here. Nobody can give me an example of what that unusual circumstance would be. I don't know, do we have a case that we can talk about here? And nobody has one. So I'm like, well, when does this happen? You know, and why is there a question on the CPA exam that's contemplating this freak of a situation? you know, um, where a company didn't follow GAAP, we knew they didn't follow GAAP and we still issued an unmodified opinion. I've never heard it, never seen it. So, you know, that would be the case from a weird theoretical standpoint. This is true, but why are we being bothered with this? I don't know, okay? All right, so that's it. That's all I got to say about that. I don't, I don't know. If you see that question on the exam, now you know the answer.
Okay, let's take a look at uh, now the modifications, okay? And the modifications now will be either qualified or adverse for what? Gap problems, depending on the pervasiveness. And then later we'll talk about a qualifier disclaimer for gas problems, okay? Now, remember, we took the approach that we understood the structure of the unmodified report, and we understood unmodified, unqualified, and we understood, we memorized the key words, the, the, par the paragraph by paragraph, all the words in most of those paragraphs and the key words on some of those others, okay? Now, again, when we are talking about gap issues, it's a question of qualified or um, adverse opinion, okay? So we're gonna go over, and we're going to look at the non-issuers report, okay? And when we look at the form and content here, I want you to flashcard for non-public companies, for non-issuers, the uh, major sections, title, address, opinion, basis, and now we're calling it a qualified opinion, and we're calling it a basis for qualified opinion. So I'm having you flashcard these high levels. I'm not going to ask you to flashcard all the words, and I'll show you why in a minute. And if you were looking at a question that was asking about the qualified report, look at how wonderful that's going to be for you, because what? Then you just simply follow from there the rest of the format that we saw for the unmodified, and it's going to be the same thing with public company unqualified report. So the strategy here is what? Know the structure as we qualify, but you don't have to memorize all those words because you would have already done what? Memorize all the words for the rest of the report by understanding the, mod um, the unmodified version, right? Okay. So when you come over, and you start to look at what we do when we have to qualify, we use the words except for the effects of the matters described in the basis for the qualified opinion. So that I do want you to flashcard. So all you're going to have to do is write the opinion the way you've memorized it, in our opinion, et cetera, and then if it's qualified, you have to add the words, except for the effects of the matters described in the basis for qualified opinion, we believe the financial statements are free material misstatement. And then when you get to the basis for the qualified opinion, just describe whatever the problem is that the problem's telling you. They didn't capitalize some leases or something. So there's nothing to memorize there. You just call out and describe what the problem is, okay? So you come over. And when you look at that language now in the opinion, in our opinion, except for the omission of the information described in the basis for the qualified opinion section, and the rest of that is exactly what I've asked you to memorize. Then you need to know that you have to say, when you call it qualified opinion, you have to know that you call it basis for qualified opinion. And then whatever it is they're telling you they did wrong, you just call it out they did not disclose something here you know and the book goes on and on about the nature of things that will cause a gap qualification something's wrong with the financial statements i don't care you don't like your buddy's suit in our in my opinion except for my buddy's shoes okay the financial statement the, the outfit looks fine Okay, it's the same idea. We don't need to go through a laundry list of things that could cause you to want to modify your opinion because it's basically they didn't follow something that GAP says, something that FASB said they should have in their financial statements. Okay, question. Memorize the entire report, unmodified report, know the structure, and then know how to tweak it when this stuff starts to happen. That's it. I mean, that's really all you need to worry about here. I'm not going to have to go through and now read another example of how you write up a problem. Okay, not necessary. Now, when our gap problems go from bad to worse, we get into what qualified versus adverse. Again, guys, same approach. Memorize the high level items. Okay. 
I'm not memorized, but flashcard the high level. And really the takeaway here is it's what adverse opinion and basis for adverse opinion and flashcard here, importantly, that you should not put a key matter section if you are giving an adverse opinion because they don't want it to overshadow the horribly bad key matter, which is that you're giving an adverse opinion on the financial statements, okay? So do include that there and is a flashcard detail. And then um, that you use the word because of the significance, okay? Instead of except for, and the way to kind of remember that a silly example, let's say you have a significant other and you guys are having one of those conversations where, hey, tell me, are there things that I can do? And you say, oh, except for the fact that you snore, you're a wonderful person, whatever, right? Okay, whatever it is, but it's not the end, right? As opposed to when you're breaking up with somebody, you're saying, because you stole money from me, I'm breaking up with you. So the because is what? Much more pointing you know, end of the story type thing is as opposed to except for everything else is okay. Okay. So we're in a more pointing situation here. And um, yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. So again, the approach is what? Just know how to tweak the basic report when what? When these things come up, a qualified for gap reasons or an adverse. They show us the adverse. And they say that what, uh, in our opinion, be, they really shouldn't use that phrase. I guess they are in our opinion. Yeah, that's okay because their opinion is bad here, right? But because of the significance of the matter, okay, there's that um, you know harsher language, basis for the adverse opinion, okay? And then the rest, aren't you glad you memorized that? Is the same, okay? So all you need to do, is memorize the basic uh, unmodified report and then know how to tweak it accordingly when things start going wrong. Okay, now that of course, and it's a very annoying guys, I know that you have to know what to do with public company, non-public company. I don't know why they can't get together. Okay, but let's take a look at the qualified opinion structure now for the public company. And again, um, flashcard the key areas and notice what they give the opinion section but unlike public company they don't call it qualified opinion in the heading i mean un unlike non-public company non-public they called it out as qualified right instead of saying um you know a basis for our unqualified opinion they just add um, a basis for a qualified opinion like we saw with the non-public companies they just add a paragraph describing what their problem is. Why are they qualified? Okay, then basis for uh, opinion is the same that you memorized before for the um, issuers and then the critical matters, you know, is whatever the critical matter is. Okay, different approach, right? Additional paragraph that describes, and notice that paragraph doesn't have a name. Okay, now you come over and you take a look and they give the opinion and notice guys, and I probably should have had you flashcard that. Um, it has the words in there, except for. So they also use the what, except for phrasing there when they're uh, qualifying the opinion, okay? And then they just go ahead. And so you would say, when you have that problem, you say, in our opinion, except for not capitalizing leases or whatever it was they were supposed to do, right? Okay, except for that. And then you describe it, whatever it is. And then the rest is exactly like you would have memorized for the um, public company unqualified report. Okay, all right, good. Now, if it's an adverse opinion, okay, and notice, guys, that the opinion paragraph, additional paragraph, 
Okay, and then we see that what this that you don't have to make a flashcard for each one of these. Okay, flashcard that that's the structure. Okay, and uh, notice they don't call out what it is, an adverse opinion. You have to read it, I guess. Maybe that's the thing that PCAOB wanted you to do is read it to find out that it's an uh, adverse opinion. And notice that when it's an adverse opinion, they do use the language what? Because of that more pointing language. So flashcard that. And then whatever the problem is, you describe it. And the rest is the same as you would have memorized now for the unqualified report for the issuers. Okay. And you can look at this example. There's the word because of, and then they describe that they didn't do something. I don't know what it was. Who cares? But it was pervasive enough to uh, result in an adverse. Okay, good. Let's take a look at this one. It looks like most of us had a chance to do this one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll a little sooner than two minutes. We're about a minute and a half. Um, man, I'm not sure why we're not getting 100% on some of these. Uh, maybe I have too high of expectations, but we said the phrase except for is in there in a qualification. Um, that should have just jumped you right at the answer. About 86% of us. Uh, got it right. At no time did we call out subject to as words. Do not present fairly is for what? Nobody picked that. That's for adverse. And um, with the foregoing explanation was not a phrase, but the phrase that we flashcard and mentioned a couple of times is what? Except for. That's in there. Okay. Okay, good. Except for the shoes, just keep that in your mind. Your buddy called you over and what did you say? Except for your shoes, your outfit looks good. Okay, question. All right, good. Let's go ahead and now let's look at modified opinion because of gas problems now. All right, okay, so now we're on the other side, right? These are, you know... Um, mutually exclusive. Well, I shouldn't say there's mutually exclusive. You could have uh, gas problems and gap problems, in which case you would call out the reasons that you're qualifying for both of those. Even when you disclaim, if you find gap problems, you have to call them out. Okay. So I shouldn't say they're mutually exclusive, but at least in terms of CPA exam questions and how they tend to ask it, they want to know what language should you use if you're dealing with gas versus gap problems. But in practice, it could be that you have both, right? Okay. But let's just go ahead and take a look. And um, remember, it's qualified versus disclaimer on the gas side, okay, versus we use the word qualified in both gap and gas problems. But as a problem to become more pervasive, go from bad to worse. For gas problems, we use the word disclaimer. For uh, gap problems, we use the word adverse, right? Okay, now let's come down and let's take a look at what happens 
um, when we have a scope limitation. Scope limitation is another way of saying gas problem, okay? We're not able to apply the procedures we want to, okay? That's a scope limitation. If your buddy's not wearing the shoes, um, the day that you look at his outfit, that's a scope problem because you can't see the shoes, right? Okay. Now, what happens? These scope limitations can come from circumstance. Okay. Scope limitations, cause and scope limitation could be because of circumstance or management imposed scope limitation. Okay. Uh, for example, let's say we were not engaged at the beginning of the year and therefore we can't observe the entity's inventory and let's say inventory is material to the financial statements. Well, what happens? If I can't see the beginning inventory, then it makes it difficult for me to figure out what the cost of goods sold is because cost of goods sold is what? Beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory, which I may be there to observe the ending inventory. If I wasn't there last year to see them count the ending inventory, then I don't know what the beginning inventory is. And if cost of goods sold, beginning inventory minus ending inventory plus cost of goods sold, beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory plus cost of goods sold. If I'm not there to see the beginning inventory, I might want to do what? Qualify or even disclaim an opinion on the income statement. I'm going to have a problem with the statement of cash flows because statement of cash flows has net income reconciled to cash provided by operating and activities. I may want to qualify or adverse the statement of stockholders equity because in the retained earnings section, here comes that annoying net income number again, right? I might be able to give an unmodified opinion on the balance sheet because what? The balance sheet is basically a year end document, right? And I would have been there at the year end to be able to see that, okay? So this would be an example of a circumstance. Now, let's say that they hire me after year end, they hire me, you know, the beginning of the next year, they hire me uh, uh, February 1st. I could go to management and say, look, we're going to have to qualify or even disclaim an opinion on the income statement, statement cash flow, statement retained earnings, whatever, um, unless you can take the inventory now. If you take the inventory now, then um, that'll solve this problem. We'll back into what the inventory must have been at January 1st, right? Because you can just back out some sales that happened in January and come up with an alternative procedure, right? Okay. Uh, that would be okay. Now, if management says, no, we're not paying for that. Well, now we have what? Now we have a scope limitation imposed by management. And if management will not remove the limitation, then we're going to probably have to uh, give a qualified or disclaimer of opinion, and we're going to probably want to talk to those charges of governance about that, okay, depending on the nature of the issue. Um, you know, you may not go to the board of directors with what I just described, although you may want them to understand that you've got a qualification coming on the income statement, et, et cetera, so maybe you would communicate that with them. Okay. Okay, now we come over and um, let's look at this discussion here, which is a little bit kind of just shoved in there, to be honest with you, um, unaudited financial statements, okay? And um, right here, disclaimer on unaudited financial statements is what I really wanna look at. And an accountant who is associated with financial statements of an uh, of an engagement conducted in accordance with PCAOB standards without auditing or reviewing them should issue a disclaimer of opinion. Uh, other requirements for this type of disclaimer include, and let's just go ahead and flashcard, the account must read the financial statements for obvious errors. Disclaimer may accompany the unaudited financial statements. Unaudited should clearly be marked on each page of the financial statements. And if the client won't correct the obvious error, uh, then the uh, auditor should withdraw 
from the engagement. So they're putting this here. And the reason I'm saying it's kind of out of place here, because they're talking about PCAOB standards, we're going to see that we're going to have this same sort of discussion when we start talking about something called a compilation of financial statements, where the auditor has not audited or reviewed the statements. For non-public companies, when you compile statements, you have this same kind of requirement that you have to read the statements for obvious errors, et cetera, and follow these rules. I'm not sure why they didn't put that in that chapter where we talk about uh, what happens if you haven't audited or reviewed. You simply compile financial statements for a non-public company. For some reason, they chose to put it here. Okay, so just flashcard those requirements. Okay, good. Now you come over and uh, let's take a look at the non-issue report when we have um, qualified now for um, gas reasons, okay? And notice, guys, that the headings are very much the same as what they would be if it was a qualification for gap reasons, okay? So they're the same, it's the same structure, essentially, right? So maybe, you can make that flashcard that I had asked you for, for the qualified for gap reasons. Maybe you should say, what's the structure of the report that's qualified for gap or gas reasons? The structure is the same, isn't it? Notice though, that we say what? We say here, the audit report should include a section, the heading qualified, we knew that. And um, the auditor should say, except for the possible matters described in the basis for the qualified opinion, and then instead of calling out some gap problem, so you still use that except for language, it's except for if it's a gap problem, except for it's a gas problem. The only difference is in the basis for your qualifying, notice it's not saying gas problem is, is, is in the heading. It just says basis for qualified. And the reader needs of the report needs to read that to see that what, it was some sort of scope limitation, right? That caused this, they weren't able to take the inventory or whatever. Okay. All right, good. Now you come over and you take a look and they give us some examples. You know, I don't care what the reason is. I really don't because it, it just it just depends on what the problem is telling you. The auditor was not able to do. Uh, if it was your buddy's shoes, you'd say my buddy didn't, basis for qualified opinion, my buddy didn't have the shoes on the day he asked me to apply on his outfit. Whatever it is, you'd call it out. Gap, generally accepted audit standards say I'm supposed to do three Hail Marys before I do every audit procedure. I was only able to do one Hail Mary, whatever it is, and you call it out. Okay. Okay, good. And then they give us another example, I think. Um, oh, disclaimer of opinion. I thought they gave us another example. Now, here's disclaimer. Okay. Now, go ahead and flashcard the headings for the disclaimer. Basis for this for disclaimer. Again, um, flashcard that we do not call out key audit matters when we start getting into the red, either adverse or disclaimer, don't call out the key audit matter, okay? The rest is the same as you have, uh, um, well, I shouldn't say the rest. Let's look at the auditor responsibility uh, for the financial statements, okay? Now, let's see what are some key things here. Um, and... Um, use the word what because of the matter described okay and um i wanted to see something there's something else up here sorry guys um right here um don't say we audited the financial statements say what we were engaged to audit the financial statement. So that's also a difference in the um, disclaimer of opinion paragraph where we, in the opinion paragraph, when it's an uh, unmodified opinion, we say we audited. Here we say we were engaged to audit because we couldn't really, we really didn't complete the audit if we're giving a disclaimer of opinion, okay? And then um, also note that we use the language because of. Okay, good. Again, guys, the um, 
structure, the, the strategy, I should say, is know the structure and of the and, and memorize the unmodified and then know how the structure is altered for modifications for gap gas reasons and then uh, know some of the key things that we do in the in the uh, changing of some of the words but you don't have to memorize all these reports i think on the tape or something in the recording i think it's gary says memorize every report who's going to do that nobody okay so the strategy is what strategy is know the structure and then know how to tweak it accordingly um, the unmodified accordingly when stuff happens okay okay let's look at what we do for gas problems um, for issuers now okay and again notice guys that this is the um, same pattern and you have to do what you have to read this thing to know that you even have a qualification here right and so in that um, uh, opinion section okay we use the word what except for okay and then we put the additional paragraph okay and in the additional paragraph why are we qualifying you didn't see our buddy's shoes and then uh, the basis for the opinion, you say, except that this um, should refer to the paragraph to describes the departure. So there you would put something in the basis for opinion paragraph that's different that describes what it was that you were not able to do. And then you still have the uh, critical audit matters. Okay, so let's take a look at that report. I think it's a little helpful here in that we give the opinion and we say in the opinion here um, that we have audited and in our opinion except for okay and then that's what we're calling on the uh, flashcard we're calling that the additional paragraph you don't call it additional paragraph on the report okay you don't put that in additional paragraph it's under the opinion it comes right after the opinion and it describes why you have um you know qualified here and then <clears throat> the basis for the opinion now we'll say except for because in the basis for opinion remember you're describing the scope of the work you did so this is where they want you to call out that you weren't able to do everything and the what in the non-public company, um, we didn't change the basis for our opinion paragraph because we weren't able to do all the things that we wanted to. I don't know why they did that because I think it would be nice to put that in the basis for the opinion paragraph. But if we go and look back at the, um, you know, the um, non-public company, the um, basis. Uh, I shouldn't call the basis for the opinion paragraph, but the um, auditor's responsibility, I found it strange. Um, oh, no. Okay, I guess we did change it for the auditor's responsibility. So strike what I was saying. It's okay. I thought they didn't have it, but they actually do have something there where they describe, um, you know, what it was that we weren't able to do in the auditor's responsibility paragraph. So that's consistent between public and non-public. Okay. Okay, good. And in the basis for the opinion, uh, it's probably worthwhile to say men to description of the reason for the inability. So they do call out the reason in those. I was thinking they didn't, but they do. In both cases, we call it out, both public and non-public. Why, what was it that we weren't able to do? Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over. And if it's disclaimer of opinion, okay, uh, very similar, okay, to what we saw for the non-public, but go ahead and um, flashcard and notice now the heading is calling out that it's a disclaimer, okay, as opposed to it wasn't calling out that it was qualified. And just as we did for the 
uh, non-public companies, we don't say we audited, we say we were engaged to, okay? Um, Um, and let's flashcard this elimination of the entire section that says we uh, conduct our audit in accords with, they don't want you to start calling out the standards and whatnot, because then somebody will think you actually are able to do that audit. Okay. And there's an example of it. Okay, good. Um, if you are not independent, then they, and you become somehow associated with the financial statements, you need to disclaim an opinion. And I think it's kind of cute. They just say, we are not independent. We're out of here. They don't want you saying a whole lot there. So flashcard that you have to call out. If you're not independent, you have to disclaim your opinion. Okay, you don't need this table, guys. This is, a, you know, I don't know how useful, why they think something like that would be useful. Uh, I think it's better to have bite-sized flashcards like we've been doing to look at this stuff. Okay, let's look at a couple of multiple choice questions. Okay, guys, we're coming up on about two minutes here, and it looks like most of us had a chance to attempt this one. So let's take a look. Okay, not too bad. Um, most of us got this right, 73%. Um, you know, you need a little practice with questions like this. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at it. And um, under which of the following would a disclaimer of opinion not be appropriate? So what, we're on the gas side, right? Something's gone wrong. There's some procedure that we weren't able to apply, okay? Now, you look and you see the auditor is unable to determine amounts associated with employee fraud scheme. Well, if I can't determine amounts, then I'm not auditing that, right? There's something I'm not able to do there. I'm not able to determine whether my buddy has good looking shoes for his interview if he don't have the shoes that day, okay? So that would be a scope issue. And that could result in what? In a disclaimer, okay? Now you look and say the client refuses to permit the auditor to confirm certain accounts receivable or apply alternative procedures. Well, they're telling you, you have this procedure of confirming receivables, you can't do it and you have no alternative. That's a scope limitation, right? Imposed by management. So you're going to go ahead and that's that could certainly lead to a disclaimer. The chief executive officer is unwilling to sign the management rep letter. Management rep letter comes at the end of the audit. 
And at the end of the audit, we ask management to put in writing, really the auditor writes it and says, here, sign this, okay? But we ask them to put in writing to us. We rewrite the letter for them, print it on their letterhead and say, read this and sign it. And they probably take it to their attorney to look at it first, but whatever. They sign off on that letter because we know what we want in it. Well, that comes at the end of the engagement and it's kind of a cover your ass step at the end of the engagement in which anything that maybe was hard to audit, you ask them to sign off that they've given you complete information and all that kind of stuff. Well, if they don't give you that letter, you cannot issue anything higher than a un, uh, anything higher than a qualified opinion. And you will probably have to what disclaim an opinion and you will likely withdraw. You may even withdraw from the engagement at that point. Although in the uh, engagement letter, you mentioned that they have to give you this letter at the end. So if they refused to um, sign that, then you would say, okay, well, here's my bill for my fees. I'm not going to give you an opinion. I'm going to disclaim an opinion on the financial statement and pay me because you signed this contract that said you would give me this. And Judge Judy is going to look at them and say, you signed the contract, buddy, pay them their fees. Okay. So the chances that this would actually happen. Now, I have been on engagements uh, where I asked for the management rep letter and they wouldn't sign it because they didn't understand what I was trying to do to them. So sometimes you have to talk them down off the shelf, you know, off those windowsill, whatever about that. But, um, you know, almost always they'll sign it. So that could very well would probably would lead to a disclaimer. So you come back up to the right answer management does not provide reasonable justification for change in accounting principle. The accounting standards say that if you're going to change your principle, you have to have justification for it. Otherwise, you cannot change the principle. So since the standard says that and they don't provide that justification, then the auditor would be uh, sitting here and saying, well, that uh, is a circumstance because you're not giving me the documents I need to explain that justification then that's going to be uh, qualified for gas or uh, adverse. So, I mean, or a disclaimer. Um, that one's kind of tricky, right? Because they mention accounting principle in there, right? But from the auditor standpoint, to be in accordance with the standard, you're going to have to give me something that shows that you were justified in that change. And if you don't, that's a scope limitation that could result in a disclaimer. So that one's kind of tricky. Question. You see what's going on here, guys, how the auditing exam in and of itself is not hard. It's just the way they, they have this talent for making the right answer sound wrong by putting the word accounting principle in there. Throws you off. Okay, so you've got to build up some resistance to that kind of stuff. And, and I you will as you have more practice with these. Okay, good. Let's look at our last question for tonight.
Okay, it looks like most of us had a chance to uh, take a look at this one since we're getting a little late here. Let's go ahead and uh, end the poll and uh, see that most of us got this right. Okay, so that's good. The answer here is D, okay? And the first thing, when you look at this, they're saying, well, there was a qualified opinion um, due to uh, the inability to obtain appropriate evidence. That's what, that's obviously a gas issue. And they want us to determine which of the paragraphs of the non issue sections of the non issue report would be affected here. Guys, the first thing to take away is there was never a time where we had some sort of modification that resulted in what? A change to the management's responsibility paragraph. Management responsibility section, their responsibility is what it is. That doesn't change because they started doing things wrong. So you can immediately do what? Eliminate B and C because there is no requirement for a modification to management responsibility. So now your only question is, well, would I um, do something in the basis for the qualified opinion? Well, that's basically where you describe why you qualify the opinion and you very well would, um, you know, give information in that section. Okay. Question. Okay, guys, good work. Uh, I think we made some good progress here. We got ourselves through what, uh, six modules or so here, five modules, okay, six modules. Okay, so that's good. That's going to give you plenty of stuff to do over the weekend, making the flashcards, getting through and starting to dig in uh, probably in the early part of the next week. Your uh, multiple choice questions, your test based simulations, you'll see in these modules. Make sure you order your textbook. Okay, if you haven't done that already, activate your software and, um, you know, get start getting through this material. Don't forget you have that um, CPA planning document that I'm going to be looking for here pretty quickly. So, um, you know, make sure you're working your way through that stuff. And, um, we will pick up with module seven next week in which we're going to start talking about now um, how we tweak the report when there are certain things that we want to call out about the financial statements, about the entity. And um, those kinds of things often come in even an unmodified report where there's something that's important enough that we want to call it out and we use phrases like emphasis on that or other matters and explanatory paragraphs if we're talking about a public company, okay? So we will get into that next time, guys. Uh, if there's no questions, any questions? All right, guys, then we will see you um, next time, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank you. Jim, I have a question. Okay, one sec. Let me uh, stop the recording.